mess with it. But make sure you paint anymore. You didn't make a person tired just fighting, huh? Your presence here. That ain't, oh man, what's your right? Then you turn boom when you get hit. That one move right there is like four big punches. The lost art of fainting, it makes fights easier for you. Makes your opponent off balance or makes him do what you want him to do. It makes you unpredictable. For most people, fainting comes naturally, but fainting safely and effectively takes a lot of work. Nobody fakes and do this. On the street, we used to do this. Yeah, come on, come on. Before you can faint at a high level, you need experience, self-awareness, and a strong technical foundation. I can help you with the last one, and that's what today's video is all about, but the rest is up to you. Here's 10 fainting tips I learned over 20 years in the sport to help fast track your progress. Number one, keep all feints functional. Use real mechanics and techniques as the foundation of your feint game. Functional movements are those that advance your position and leave you with different options to deal with different responses. The easiest way to keep your feints functional is to stick with real punch mechanics and head movements. These feints will be easier to sell, much more energy efficient, and much safer since your training will hopefully have taught you the different openings, opportunities, and escape routes that come with them. For example, faking a cross using real cross mechanics with some hip rotation and a slight weight shift literally advances your position, moving you a bit closer to the opponent while also loading your body for an outside slip or weave, a lead hand jab, hook, or uppercut, or a pivot to the outside. You present a credible threat, you creep closer with good position, and you've got options to follow up with offense, defense, and exits depending on how your opponent reacts. This is a functional feint. In contrast, feinting the cross by throwing your arm out to one side does none of these things, while also leaving you open for a jab or a hook. That movement bears little resemblance to a real cross, and it definitely isn't functional. Remember, if you aren't feinting with functional movement, you're probably feinting yourself out of position, which is a gift to your opponent. Whatever you do, don't do that. Keep your hands where you can use them and your feet in a fighting stance. Number two, feint small. There is a time for hard, high commitment feints, like full on head slot changes and sharp half punches, but the vast majority of your feints should be much smaller and much shorter. When feinting punches, for example, you wanna show about 10 or 15% of your punch technique at most, unless you're going all in to create defensive traffic on that side or change head slots to load the opposite hand. Small feints leave fewer openings in your defense, they cost less energy, and they're much more believable since skilled fighters expect their opponents to use small, efficient movements when punching, not big dramatic ones. Of course, this isn't true at all levels. Elite boxers' feints will be almost imperceptible to the untrained eye. Simply twitching the rear hand or turning the thumb over could be enough to sell the cross, for example, since they'll be watching for the smallest of startup movements. However, against a novice class amateur, you may need a bigger feint to sell the threat, since they're not as used to picking up on subtle cues. As a general rule, I like to say the better the boxer, the smaller the feint. Still, even with a novice, you should start small. Just like with slipping, you want to move as little as possible just enough to get the job done. If they don't bite, you can go bigger, although that's not always the answer. You might just need to change tempo, spend more time establishing the threat, or use the wide-eyed trick, all of which I'll be covering later on. Number three, feint with good defense. If your feint movements aren't functional, advancing your position and giving you a variety of follow-up options, they should at least be defensively sound. Pretty much any movement can work as a feint against the right opponent, but the best ones will maintain or improve your defense by putting your hands in the way or moving your head off the line. Granted, if your opponent isn't in position to punch, you can get away with almost anything. But if they are, your feint should never compromise your defense, especially since they're often meant to goad opponents into punching. Another thing to keep in mind, feints without defense are usually feints without offense. If you throw your hand out of position to defend, it's probably out of position to attack on time too. The same holds true if your feint moves you off balance or out of your fighting stance. So remember, whatever you do, keep your feints defensively sound. Number four, feint with your eyes. There are at least two ways to do this. The first, which most people are probably already familiar with, involves looking one place, then punching someplace else. I'm gonna react like I'm hitting him in his body, but I go upstairs. Look as if you're going to the body, and you're going to the head, and then I go up. For example, you might look down at the body and then punch up high. This is a true standalone eye feint. It's easy and effective, and you should be doing it. The second option is not a standalone technique, but rather an add on or a means to upgrade any feint you're looking to sell. 
Something I noticed early on in myself, then later on in other fighters, is how my face changes whenever I'm committing to an attack. It's not some dramatic snarl or barring of teeth, but once you know what to look for, it's really just as obvious. What I noticed is that my eyes open up wide, like a crazy person's. And I'm not the only one. Plenty of fighters do this on the attack, and it's actually a deliberate technique used outside of boxing by hunters and outdoorsmen, known as wide-angle vision. This is exactly what it sounds like. You open your eyes wide to literally widen your field of view. Think of it like pushing out the walls of your peripheral vision to enhance your perceptive powers. By unfocusing your vision in this way, you lose out on finer details, but you greatly enhance your ability to detect motion. But even if you don't subscribe to the whole idea of wide-angle vision, the fact is that fighters open their eyes wide when entering into high-risk situations in order to spot small startup movements and avoid punches, and we can weaponize this habit for better feinting. I know I open my eyes wide instinctively whenever I'm committing to offense, so now I do it deliberately whenever I feint to really sell the threat. And you should too. Number five, faint outside the box to expand your arsenal. But I'm not gonna just keep coming the same way. But I gotta get more creative. I can't get lazy, just ha ha, ha ha. Come the same way, they gonna, you know, faking him with different things or giving him fakes and, 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 and different tip your hat and, and bow and all these things. By now, you know all faint should be functional, but that doesn't mean you have to limit yourself to punch mechanics and head movements. Anything you can do in the ring, you can pretend to do, from lateral movement to level changes. As long as the move meets the other criteria covered here, that is, they are defensively sound, fully functional, small, and efficient, it's fair game. Here's a few simple feints worth adding to the arsenal. If you're bringing your hand up to your head, basically you're making your opponent react. So if I'm throwing a fake, there's the fake. Simply lifting your lead hand to your hairline, like you're tipping your hat, can be enough to suggest a jab is coming especially if you make a habit of jabbing out of a closed guard. As with most feints, it's best sold with a fast twitching motion, although it fits nicely into a flow of softer feints as well. It can also be combined with other feints like sits and weld-in feints if you need to up the threat level. I'm a big fan of this feint because it's subtle, efficient, versatile, and most importantly, safe, since it moves your hand and elbow into position to cover the center line, block, and parry anything coming your way. Sit feints suggest a level change, when in reality, you only drop down a few inches. This is not a quarter squat, it is a controlled fall into a fighting stance, like a micro bob or weave, which is much better for speed and energy efficiency. Level changes are used for all kinds of techniques, like body punches and bump ins, so sit feints are as versatile as they are efficient. Many fighters also sit or sink down into their stance like this before they jab, particularly when they're stepping in hard for max reach and power. I like to spam sit feints because they're defensively sound, they leave your hands free to work, and they put you in position to follow up with almost anything, with a good base, no forward commitment, and the legs loaded for big drives in any direction. This foot feint is named after the late, great Kenny Weldon, who used this rhythmic movement as both a teaching tool and as the foundation of his signature fighting style. Weldon feints, or Weldons, can be used to feint movement in all directions. To fake forward movement and sell jab feints, for example, keep the rear foot grounded with your head and weight back as you step forward a few inches with the lead foot. Then, as soon as the ball of that foot touches the ground, spring back to your normal stance. This is sometimes known as a pendulum step, and I've also heard Coach Anthony call it a springboard, which I think is a great name. You can loop this forward and backward movement to get into a soft fainting rhythm, which is great to camouflage jabs and lead right hand or you can explode into the step as a hard feint to get a big reaction. Faking steps left or right works much the same way, where we step left or right with our left or right foot, respectively, and spring back the other way as soon as the ball of that foot touches the ground. Faking lateral movement in this way is great for shaking stalkers, drawing collision punches, and camouflaging step pivots. Plus, you can always spring back into a punch of your own for extra power. Note that we never compromise our stance with weldings, as is the case with the rhythm step, a term coined by seminal boxing coach Barry Robinson of A Million Styles Boxing. We step into a slightly longer or wider stance, then we rhythm back into our default boxing position. You should always be on balance and in position to move, attack, and defend. If you're not, you step too far and you f***ed up. Number six, change tempo. Combine hard and soft feints to make both better. 
It's important to mix up your fainting techniques, and it's even more important to mix up your fainting tempo. Fainting slow or soft is good, and fainting hard and fast is also good for different reasons, but they work best in combination. So what's the difference exactly? Soft faints are slower, smoother, and less committal. These are your guard changes, your tilts, your small shoulder and hand movements, your subtle shifts from hip to hip, and your easy pawing punches. Soft fainting like this is all about creating safe, non-committal movement from your fighting stance so that your opponent can never be sure when you're really working. Soft fainting doesn't look very impressive, but it does a lot at once. It helps you stay loose, keeps you looking busy, camouflages your startup motions, loads different leads, and in the case of pawing punches, creates defensive traffic to block punch lanes and put long guard tools online. For the most part, you should pretty much always be soft fainting. When done properly, soft feints don't compromise your defense or your stance. They don't limit your options, and they don't use a lot of energy. On the contrary, I find the slow flow helps me conserve energy since I can stay relaxed and I never have to beat inertia. Like a tennis player bouncing on their toes, I'm always moving just a bit so I don't have to spend extra energy accelerating from a dead stop, and I can react that much quicker. Most opponents won't bite on soft feints, which is fine. By now, your soft feints are functional, so by ignoring these movements, your opponent is giving you freebies. They're letting you get into position for follow-up techniques and giving you a head start on whatever you choose to do next. For example, a small soft flow tilt to my lead hip is all I need to load a powerful lead hook or uppercut, and a pawing half jab is all I need to block your punch lanes, activate my long guard, or get a head start on a hand trap. By ignoring these, you're just helping me out. That's up. In contrast to soft feints, hard feints are explosive, erratic, and more committal. They match the intensity of a punch, so they're much more threatening. These are your slips to new head slots, your sharp full body punch fakes, your hard sits, and your stutter steps. These are what most people imagine when they think of fainting. They're the ones that'll freeze opponents, send them running out of range, or lure their hands out of position. However, because of their higher commitment level and energy demands, you can't hard faint all the time, just as we cannot always punch at full power, nor should you. Instead, I recommend working out of a near constant flow of soft feints, occasionally punctuated with hard feints to gather data and create openings. Your harder, faster feints will be that much more dramatic and threatening when you first lull your opponent to sleep with a baseline of slow, smooth movements. Deliberate tempo changes like these give you the best of both worlds. Number seven, establish credible threats. Sell your feints like fencing maestro Charles Selberg. Using the strike that you want to feint with is important. So if I want to use that right shoulder feint, what I'm going to do is throw my right hand. So after you establish a threat, always to look to leverage that threat. Feints work better if you've already landed the punch you're pretending to throw. In the words of fencing maestro Charles Selberg, it creates a sensitivity that we can exploit later on. I think of every touch I put on somebody as kind of like I burn them. And uh, they'll remember that burn and I'll come back and then I'll faint at that sensitive spot and draw a response, you see. If you land a jab like this, your opponent will remember it and they'll be more reactive the next time you fake that punch. But you don't have to actually land punches to establish credible threats. As Selberg says, even if you don't connect, you can show your opponent you're crazy enough to try. If I make it, fine. If I don't make it, fine. The idea is not necessarily to score on that attack, but it's to serve notice on my opponent that I'm crazy enough to try, you see. If the opponent blocks, they'll feel your power, and if they make you miss altogether, they'll see it. Slamming a hard punch into their guard with bad intentions, but no intention of landing, can create the same sensitivity. So keep that in mind. Number eight, sell feints with sound. Sharp exhales, grunts, and other sounds you make naturally while punching can be done deliberately to sell your threats. This is something you can start doing right away, without any real drilling, to instantly level up your feint game. This works with any hard feint, and it works really well. Number 9. Feint with tells. Reverse engineer and weaponize your habits. 
Fainting is all about knowing yourself. Fighters work hard in the gym to hide their tells, but everyone has some that are unique to them. As you become more aware of the subtle ways you telegraph your punches, you'll unlock all kinds of new fainting tools. Let me give you an example. For a while, I would telegraph my jab by sliding my lead elbow in towards my midline before I punched. I was doing this subconsciously to shorten the shot and get the inside track on my opponent, but that small move from a slightly flared to tucked elbow position was giving me away. The textbook solution would be to mine my elbows so I'd always start from that tucked position. But once I became aware of this tell, I realized I could use it to my advantage. Out of nowhere, this tiny elbow tuck became one of my sneakier feints. This is also where the wide eye feint came from. I identified a tell, and then I used it to make my own feints more convincing. Finally, number 10, feint with purpose. Mindless movements make you predictable and put you at risk. So don't start feinting just because you can't think of anything better to do. You should always know what you're trying to accomplish and understand the different threats and opportunities different feints present before you try them on a live opponent. Mindless movement is not just a waste of energy. It also makes you easy to read, easy to time, and easy to walk into collision punches. You don't have to hold all this in your head while you fight, but you do have to design feinting drills mindfully and rep them out until they become second nature. So there you have it, 10 tips to improve your feint game. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, I'll be down in the comments section to answer any questions.